let's take an overview of the hydraulic systems. We've got three completely independent hydraulic systems um, to operate the ailerons, the elevator, the rudder, so all the primary flight controls, the flight and ground spoilers, the wheel brakes, the nose wheel steering, and the landing gear. All hydraulic systems operate a working pressure of 3000 psi, and the system uses synthetic hydraulic fluid like Skydraw 500B or the equivalent. Systems are identified as systems 1, 2, and 3. They all operate continuously, and each system has two hydraulic pumps of, of various descriptions. The pilots control the systems from a control panel on the overhead panel in the flight deck, and system indication is presented on the ICAS, which consists of uh, pressure indication, fluid temperature indication, fluid quantity indication. We can see what's happening with all the pumps. We can see what's happening with the various shutoff valves, and we can also see what pressure is available in the braking system. All that information is presented on the hydraulic synoptic page. For uh, unless you've got the hydraulic synoptic page in view, apart from that, there is no other indication other than if they start to have failure situations. So each hydraulic system, as we said, has two hydraulic pumps. So for system one, we've got a hydraulic pump 1A, which is the engine driven pump, with a backup provided by a, an electric pump designated as pump 1B. System 2 is similar, of course, except the engine pump is on um, the right-hand engine and it's two, pump 2A. <clears throat> we also have an electric pump designated as pump 2B. System 3, there's no third engine, so we have, for system 3, we have two electric pumps. Pump 3A, which runs continuously, and then it's backed up with a second electric pump, which is pump 3B. Pump 3B is automatically powered from the ADG in an extreme emergency, and we'll look at that in a minute. So in normal system operation, all six pumps will be operating during takeoff and landing um, as long as the B pumps are selected to the auto position. And this is linked into the position of the flaps. Now the B pumps have got a switch, which we'll look at in a bit later on. Uh, it's got a switch. We've got off, auto, and on. This is the B pumps. So 1B, 2B, and 3B. Off auto and on. Now the auto position is a little bit um, unusual. You would think, you'll be forgiven for thinking that in the auto position, the B pump would automatically take over if the A pump were to fail. That actually is not the case. The auto position, it's turned on only when the flaps are not at zero. If the engine pump fails, for example, the crew have to manually turn on the B pump by putting the switch to the on position. It will not come on automatically if there's a pump failure, which is a little bit unusual. So we'll look at the logic a bit later on in more detail, but just hold that thought. The auto position for the B pumps does not mean that they come on automatically if a pump fails, what it means is they come on automatically when the flaps are not at zero, causing all six pumps to be running. So you'll have, the, during a normal takeoff, you'd have the two engine pumps obviously running. Then when you put the flaps not at zero, the B pumps can come on. And then when the flaps go up to zero, the B pumps are switched off. If an engine fails now, then the crew would have to turn on the B pump to replace it. So when the flaps are isolated on the poach approach, the pumps are enabled, and obviously during takeoff, it's basically just linked into the flap position. It doesn't care if they 
doesn't care if the landing gears up or down or whether it's approach or takeoff it's just purely looking at the flat position if pump fails in flight if pump for a fails in flight the b pump has to be selected to the on position to restore capability and that's true for the system one two and three all system components are connected by rigid lines and flexible hoses deutsche uh, perma swage couplings are used at permanent joints. Harrison flareless couplings are used at removable pipe connections. So this says, this diagram just really shows you what services are are being powered from which hydraulic system. We can see our three systems there. We can see the six pumps. So system one has an engine pump and an AC uh, electric pump, and it's operating the left aileron, the rudder, the left elevator the left and right flight spoilers and the ground spoilers. System three has two pumps, but they're both electric. Uh, they're doing the left and right ailerons, the rudder, the left and right elevator, the inboard brakes, the main landing gear, the nose gear, um, incorporating in-flight braking, and the nose or steering, and the nose landing gear doors. System two does the right aileron, the rudder as well. Remember, that on the rudder there are three hydraulic uh, actuators. The right elevator. Remember, on the elevators there are four hydraulic uh, actuators altogether. The left and right flight spoilers, the outboard pair of brakes, and the main landing gear down lock assist actuator. Uh, so we'll look into that when we look at the landing gear. But the main hydraulic system for normal extension and retraction is actually number three system. The Downlock assist thing from the number two system only comes into play when we're doing an emergency extension. But we'll look at that when we do the landing gear. So here we can see the hydraulic synoptic page and also the hydraulic control panel. So you'll notice on the hydraulic control panel there are four switches for the four electric pumps. So there aren't any control switches for the engine pumps. You can't really control the engine pumps. If the engines are running, um, it's available. Um, and you'll notice from the reservoir that if you look at the synoptic page, you'll see um, the reservoir and then there's a feed line going to the engine, the 1A pump. There's a shutoff valve, which is normally open. The only time that shutoff valve closes is when you push the fire push button. Um, and that causes the, um, amongst other things, it causes the hydraulic shutoff valve to close. But obviously, if you do that, you're also going to shut down the engine. That's the only real, that's the only way to, to um, uh, isolate the uh, engine pump. The, so the four switches on the control panel are for the electric pump. So you've got the one, um, if effectively it's one B. It doesn't actually say B on there, but it's the number one electric pump, which is the B pump, off, auto and on. The three A pump, that's, a, that's the pump that's designed to run continuously. So that's just got on or off. It just runs continuously. It's the primary pump for the number three system. Number three B pump is off auto and on. And the two pump, the two B pump off auto and on. And you'll see the note there on the, on the slide. It says the auto position of the B pumps only turns on the B pumps when the flaps are not at zero. It does not turn them on in the event of a pump failure of a pump failure or a low pressure condition. If that happens, they have to manually switch that switch to the on position. So looking at system one, OK, now don't worry too much about the schematic, because on the next slide, we're going to zoom in on it and we'll just go through it step by step. But just to, to summarize, then the hydraulic pressure is supplied, supplied by engine pump 1A on the gearbox of the number one engine with an alternate supply provided by pump 1B, which is the electric pump. This is pump 1B. This pump is powered from AC Buzz 2. So it's kind of powered from the other side. And that's important. I'll come back to the reason why in a minute. So the pump 1B, which is basically the left-hand system, is powered from AC Buzz 2, which is effectively, if you remember, from the electrical system, from the right-hand system. The main components of the hydraulic system one are, are basically on the left hand side of the aft equipment bay. So in fact, um, the reservoirs, um, the fill points, the, um, all the filters and stuff and the electric pump, they're for both systems, 
number one and two, they're all in the aft equipment bay, but it's on the left hand side. Now, just turning back to this power source for the B pumps. So we can see that the B pumps are powered from AC Buzz 2 for the 1B pump, and actually AC um, Buzz 1 will provide power to pump uh, 2B. Now, if you cast in your mind back to the electrical system, we know that if we have a generator failure within the electrical system, because of all the transfer contactors, etc., etc., we don't necessarily lose power on the two AC buzzes. So normally going back to the electrical system, if you remember, generator one feeds AC buzz one, generator two feeds AC buzz two. If you lose a generator, the system to, can tie together the generator line contact that goes to the transfer position and so on. And generator two can power AC buzz one. Now, that's great, so we've still got power and AC buzz one, but in the hydraulic system and from a hydraulic pump perspective, not only do we need power on the actual buzz for it to work, but what is also a major factor is what is the source of power for that buzz bar. What is the source of power for the buzz bar? And we'll go through the electrical diagram later on. And that's why they've cross-connected them. Because if the source of power is anything other than a generator, you will lose, not the buzz, because we know that doesn't happen, but you'll lose the pump. So let's have a look at our scenario. <coughs> Excuse me, we will cover it later when we go through the electrical diagram. If, if during a takeoff, so we're taking off, so therefore our flaps will not be at zero. So we've got all six pumps running. We take off, and let's say we have an engine failure during takeoff. Um, the reason uh, we have the logic, so the pumps are running with the uh, flaps not zero. So in that situation, the pump, the, the electric pump for the engine that's failed is running and is already up and running. It's up to speed. You're not going to get any drop in hydraulic pressure. It's kind of a seamless uh, situation. However, because uh, let's say we lose engine number one. Um, so we take off, we lose engine number one. We're going to lose engine pump 1A. Engine pump 1B is already running because the flaps are not at zero. So there's no problem there. But the important thing is that the pump 1B power is coming from the other side because uh, if we lose a generator, we lose the pump that's providing power from that generator, which in this case is the pump 2B, if we lose engine number one during takeoff. Um, so during the takeoff run, all six pumps are running. We lose engine number one during takeoff. Pump 1B is running, no problem, it's already running. So we don't lose any hydraulic power on the number one side and it's power from AC bus two. But what will happen we will lose pump 2B. That will stop because it's powered from AC buzz 1. And the generator is not power, the generator 1 is not, power, is not providing power to buzz 1 anymore. Buzz 1 is now being powered from the, the other generator. But we will lose pump 2B. It's not a huge issue because 2A engine pump is still running. So we just need to hold that thought as well, and we'll get, again, we'll go through it during the electrical diagram, and it'll become clear. But just that's the reason why they've cross-connected the electrical system. So pump 1B is powered from the AC Buzz 2, pump 2B is powered from AC Buzz 1. OK, so let's walk through this um, this schematic. So we have our reservoir. This is for systems one and two. They're very similar to each other. So we've got a reservoir and it's a bootstrap reservoir. So it's pressurized and we're, we'll talk about that in a second. And you have a feed line that runs to the engine pump. Um, which is down here. 
uh, sorry, this line. Fire, via a firewall shut off valve to the engine pump. And you also have a feed line running to the B pump, the electric pump. There's no shut off system for or shut off valve for the B pump. So the engine pump, if the engine was running, is producing our 3000 psi, and that's supplied via a check valve to the pressure manifold. And before the check valve, there's a pressure switch that's used just to monitor the status of the engine pump and it's used by the um, DCUs to work out what's happening with our e engine pump and to indicate any failures. Passes through a check valve, then through a filter that has a differential pressure indicator if it's clogged, but no bypass capability. If that filter is totally blocked, then the fluid is also blocked. We don't want to pump dirty fluid around all our components because then we'll have a, a, a very big nightmare situation and we'd have to replace all our components. <clears throat> so uh, after the filter, we then have a pressure transducer um, and this is the um, component that's providing our pressure indication. And the fluid goes off and does all its work. So this is for system one and is all the services for system two. We also have an accumulator here, charged up with nitrogen. Once the fluid has done its work, it's returned via a check valve, uh, via another filter, but the return filter does have a bypass capability and a differential pressure indicator. So if the return filter is clogged, then it will allow the fluid to return back into the reservoir. Okay, so potentially dirty fluid could end up back in the reservoir. It doesn't matter so much because any dirty fluid that then gets recirculated is going to be captured by the main pressure filter. <clears throat> we, this line here is the return line from the um, outboard brakes, which is only for system two. Uh, we also have a similar thing going on with the electric pump. So we've got engine uh, electric pump produces 3000 psi, it passes into the pressure manifold and there's a pressure switch monitoring the electric pump output and again the DCU will, will use this and plus this to work out what's happening with our hydraulic system and what's happening with the electric pump. Through a check valve, through the same filter, the same pressure filter that the engine pump was using and it goes off to do its work. The pumps have a case drain so they get lubricated and cooled using the hydraulic fluid and that case drain fluid is returned via a case drain filter goes back into the reservoir. Same with the engine pump. There's a case drain and the case drain filter goes back into the reservoir. Okay. So we've got in the um, number one and two systems, we've got one, two, three, four filters. A pressure filter, a return filter, and then two case drain filters for the two pumps. Any fluid that might leak is captured in an ecology bottle or an overflow bottle. In the reservoir there's also a bleed valve and relief valve. The bleed valve is manually operated and is used to bleed any air from the reservoir. But what you shouldn't do though is operate this valve to try and dissipate the hydraulic pressure because definitely you will fill that bottle. If the relief valve operates the fluid will be captured in a NIS overflow bottle. Okay so just one um, overflow uh, bottle. Okay just there. We've got provision for um, um, putting a hydraulic rig on so we've got a ground service suction and a ground service pressure connections for the hydraulic rigs there and there. OK, <clears throat> and we also have another service point for filling the reservoir. So when we fill the reservoir, we pump the fluid from a, um, a container. It passes through the return filter and fills up the reservoir. Now, what we said was the reservoir is a bootstrap reservoir and it's pressurized. It uses system pressure to pressurize it. So the reservoir has got two chambers. You've got this main reservoir chamber here that feeds the pumps 
and gets all the return fluid. And then you've got this smaller chamber here, which is sealed off from the main chamber, uh, but much smaller. This, it gets pressure from the supply line, the pressure line. So pressure is routed up in here to this smaller chamber. So 3,000 PSI is pumped into this small chamber here. That will cause this piston to move down and effectively create a pressure in the main reservoir so the pumps don't cavitate, particularly the engine pump, which is at a higher, obviously a higher level. So there's a constant head of pressure supplied to the pump because this chamber is effectively pressurized. So you've got 3,000 psi in here. You don't have 3,000 psi in there because of the differential areas. So what you end up with, I can't remember the figures off the top of my head. Um, it's around about 50-odd um, psi, if I remember rightly. I think it's coming up on the next slide. So you've got 50 psi of pressure in here, making a head of pressure available to the pumps the engine pump and the um, electric pump. Um, with a pressure relief valve, that's set to 60 to 70 odd PSI, for, or maybe 80 PSI, if I remember rightly. I think the figure will be coming up on another slide. So that's system one and system two, fairly straightforward. I uh, don't think there's anything else I need to mention on here. Obviously, we've got a ground service uh, connection for the accumulator there. All these ground servicing points, they're, they're all in, in fact, all of these components, in fact, are all in the aft equipment bay. So this is just zoomed in on the main reservoir. Um, so we have two separate chambers, as we mentioned, the large one that feeds the pumps and then the smaller one. The smaller one is pressure, pressure uh, receives pressure, 3,000 psi in that smaller chamber, which causes a pressure in the large chamber of 55 psi. So I was right. <clears throat> so this pressure provides a pro positive feed to the um, pumps at all altitudes and attitudes. What we've also can see on here that we didn't mention before, a couple of things. One, a fluid temp sensor. Um, uh, which is housed in the reservoir there, that will generate a uh, message if the fluid um, overheats. And also quantity information. I don't know if you noticed on the synoptic page, it displays the reservoir contents in a, in a percentage form. And um, the reason they use percentage is because actually all the reservoirs are of different sizes. This one uh, has got 150 cubic inch, uh, but the others are different and we'll look at that later. Um, so there's a method of um, calculating the reservoir contents and it's done with a transducer that's linked by a cable joining onto the piston and that reservoir piston obviously is going to move up and down as the level changes and as that piston moves up and down it drives a, um, a gear a, a, um, a rotary gear and on the rotary gear there's a mechanical quantity indicator and also an electrical transmitter like an RVDT a rotary variable differential transmitter and the position of that transmitter will then be translated into contents but we there's also a mechanical contents gauge on the end of the reservoir and you can just see it there at the bottom of the picture where it says reservoir quantity indication and transmitter. So the transmitter is driven mechanically by a cable attached to the piston. And then the rotation of the transmitter generates an electrical signal going to the um, um, DCU. On the engine pump side of things, we've got a hydraulic um, shutoff valve, for one for the left, one for the right. This shuts off the supply of fluid going from the reservoir to the engine driven pump. So the fire zone gets kind of shut, uh, isolated from the, the rest of the aircraft. So we're not pumping potentially flammable fluids into a fire zone. That um, shutoff valve is powered off the emergency bus. So we're always going to go have power on that buzz from the batteries. And 
um, it goes through that uh, left and right engine shut off relay and that relay is operated when you push the fire push button the big red fire push button and that will drive the firewall shut off valve to close and if the relay is de-energized um, it just defaults to the open position so the shutoff valve is always open. The only time it closes is when um, you have a fire situation, you've pushed the fire button. The engine pump uh, mounted on the engine gearbox has a rated delivery of 10.85 gallons per minute. Working pressure, normal discharge pressure of 3000 PSI. Um, minimum flow at uh, full flow pressure. Uh, well, sorry, minimum full flow pressure is um, 2,850 PSI. Maximum case drain flow at zero output flow is six gallons per minute and a rated speed of 5,000 RPM. So apart from the engine pump, which is obviously on the engine, all the other major components are in the aft equipment bay for the systems one and two um, on the left and right hand sides respectively. You can see as you as you enter into the bay right at the entrance to the bay area you'll see the um, servicing points so you've got the accumulator charging point the um, hydraulic rig connections pressure and return and then a the system fill point um, and then you've got the reservoirs the uh, electric pump and the filter manifold they're all inside the um, on the left and right hand sides of the of the aft equipment bay. For the electric pump, um, so it's, a, it's an AC pump powered off AC buzzes one or two. For, so AC buzz one for the number two pump, AC buzz two for the number one pump. Um, draws 25 amps continuously. The current draw initial, on, initial startup is quite high, 125 amps. Um, the engine pump pressure output is 3000 psi, same as the engine. Um, the minimum full flow pressure is 2700 psi, and case drain flow is uh, 0.6 gallons per minute. The, the, the other, the main real significance difference between the engine pump, pump sort of uh, performance and the electric pump performance is actually um, the delivery rate, the flow rate which is significantly less. I mean, the engine pump was nearly 11 gallons per minute. The electric pump flow rate is only 3.7 gallons per minute. Um, the other difference though is between the left and right sides or number one, number two system is reservoir two is completely identical in operation to number one, but it's different capacity, it's larger. So uh, the reservoir two capacity is 240 cubic inches number one was uh, 150. This difference is due to the fact that the number two system powers the outboard brakes and the number one system doesn't do any of the braking system. Number two system does the outboard brakes and um, also the other difference is the reservoir, the number two reservoir has an additional return line from the outboard brakes as we saw in that schematic I think earlier on. The number three system it's very similar to systems one and two, but obviously we haven't got an engine pump. Instead, we've got two electric pumps, 3A and 3B. Power to supply to the pumps normally is, so they're both, a, they're both AC pumps. So AC buzz two to pump 3A and AC buzz one to pump 3B. But as we'll see a bit later on, there is also another alternative power supply to the uh, three pump. Um, for the ADG thing, so but we'll look at that later. Each pump is manually controlled by a switch on the hydraulic panel. The 3A switch is either on or off because it's normally switched on and left on, and 3B has got on, off, and auto. When the system is in the auto position, which is a normal position for flight, the pump activates automatically whenever the flaps are not at zero, and at least one of the engine generators is working. It doesn't matter which one, but we need one generator working. All the components for the number three system are locate, located near or in the main landing gear wheel wells, except for the pumps, 
which are located in the left and right side fillets of the aft belly fairing. <clears throat> so they're not in the, the number three system components are not in the aft equipment bay. <clears throat> okay, let's take a walk through the number three system, very similar to the number one and two. We've got our reservoir, which is a bootstrap reservoir. So you've got a smaller chamber here, which is receiving pressure from the system, 3000 PSI, and it, that will then cause this main chamber to be pressurized to about 50 odd PSI. Two supply lines running down to the two electric driven pumps, the A and B pumps. Um, so from the A and B pumps, the pressure then is routed through to the pressure manifold. And once again, we've got a pressure switch before it goes to the check valve. We've got a pressure switch monitoring the output of each pump. So we can find out what pump's running, what pump isn't running, and so on. From the manifold then, it gets filtered. No bypass capability. There is a differential pressure indicator as the filter gets clogged. And then it goes off, charges up the accumulator and <clears throat> goes off and does its work. And then it's returned via a return filter. This does have a capability of bypassing if it gets clogged. It's also got a differential pressure indicator and the return fluid goes back into the reservoir. Similar to the number two system, we've got a dedicated return line from this time the inboard brakes. The uh, pumps are <clears throat> cooled and lubricated using fluid, their own fluid, and there's a case drain and a case drain filter from each one that ports the case drain fluid back into the uh, reservoir. We've also got um, ground service pressure, ground service return for the rigs. We've got a ground service fill connection that when you fill it, it filters it through the return filter and into the reservoir to fill it up. The there's a tra temperature transmitter on the reservoir like there is in the number one and two, and there's a quantity indicator on the end of the reservoir, just as the same as it is on number one, number two. Uh, we've also got pressure relief valve here. I didn't mention it before on the others, but the number one and number two have that set to about 3,600 PSI and just ports any excess pressure back via return to the reservoir. Well, there's also a temperature, uh, sorry, a pressure transducer on the pressure manifold, um, and that's how we display our pressure indication. Here we can see our number three system component locations which are mainly in the main landing gear well, apart from the electric pumps, which are in an access panel, access through the wing fillet area on the left and right hand sides. Uh, the electric pumps, in fact, they're identical to the number one, number two system electric pumps. So they're all the same rating and so on. Um, the number three system reservoir is the largest of all reservoirs. It's the 690 cubic inches um, and the reason it's so big is because it's the number three system that does the landing gear, plus the nose wheel steering, and then the inboard brakes, and then plus, of course, all the primary flight controls. The inlet and the outlet ports are identical to those on the number one, uh, sorry, on the number two system, because you've got that additional return connection from the inboard brakes. So just want to highlight a couple of things on here. Looking back at the synoptic page again, you can see the uh, reservoirs, the temperature is displayed there, the percentage quantity is displayed, and then you've got the flow tubes showing you the flow going to the pumps and then from the pumps to the services. And then it displays in a box how much pr service pressure is uh, available. The flow tubes, the color from the reservoir to the pump is quantity dependent and the colour from the pump downwards is pressure dependent. So it'll either be green or amber, <clears throat> depending on the, either the pressure or the quantity. In addition, a red flow tube will show to the engine pump if there is a fire indication 
and at this stage you haven't pushed the fire push button. So that flow tube, the flow, uh, the shutoff valve will be open at that stage and the flow tube will be red. After it's been pushed, the shutoff valve will close. So it will be green flowing from the reservoir to the shutoff valve and then white from the shutoff valve to the engine. So this chart just shows the various different colors and when it's going to be green, when it's going to be amber, when it's going to be white. Um, and the color coding throughout the synoptics is consistent with any ICAST messages that might be shown as well. OK, so let's take a walk through this electrical diagram for the control of engine um, uh, electric pump 1B. So here's our control switch, off, auto, and on. The electrical diagram is drawn with the switch in the off position. We've got a couple of power supplies here that we need to think about. AC Buzz 2 for the actual pump, and DC Buzz 2 for the control side of things. Now let's do the easy one first. Let's put the pump switch in the on position. So with the pump switch in the on position, we get a power supply up through those closed contacts there, and it comes along to this relay here, and at the moment it's going nowhere, um, and it stops at that point. We've also got a power supply coming down here to the um, generator line contactor number two, number two, this is controlling pump one, don't forget, but number two GLC. The, and if the generator number two is online, this relay will be closed. Boom, boom, boom. So power comes down here and boom, boom, boom. It will energize the engine interlock relay here, which is JB10. That's where it's located. It's in junction box 10. So this will now energize. Boom. This closes this set of contacts here. Boom, boom, boom. And power now comes along here to the pump relay. Boom, that energizes and hooks up the AC Buzz 2 power supply to hide pump 1B. And that starts running. And we switched it on. Okay, good. Well, normally though, the switch is in the auto position. And in the auto position, remember, the only thing that triggers it in the auto position, nothing to do with what the pressure is or anything like that is to do with the flap position. So we know we want to turn on the pump when the flaps are not at zero. So let's take a look. So now the power supply from DC Buzz 2 comes along down through those contacts there and it routes along to this auto mode relay here and it gets that as far as there and stops. <coughs> So it's looking at this, we need to energize this auto mode relay. So when flaps are not at zero, i.e. flaps are greater than zero, this will be closed, boom. Got a ground signal there. This auto mode relay now energizes. So that puts the power up to here again, and it comes along to here. And we still need to close this relay. So this relay will be closed as long as Generator 2 is online. Boom, boom, boom. So generator 2 is online. That's good. Boom. The pump will run. Pump 1B will run. So the generator position is really important. Remember, in a normal situation, the same thing is going on for pump number 2. But instead of Instead of a relay GLC2, it's been looking at GLC1. So let's look at a situation where we take off. So flaps are not at zero. Pump 1B is running. But we lose engine 2. We lose engine 2. Engine 1 is still running. So engine one A pump, the engine pump that's working. Prior to the lo losing of engine two, the pump one B was running because we're in flaps at not at zero, but we lose engine two on takeoff. 
When we lose engine two, the generator line contactor number two will not be in the generator position. It will go to the transfer position, in fact. And although we've still got power on AC bus two, because of the, trans the electrical transfer that takes place, we still have power on AC bus two, but because the generator line contactor is not for the number two engine, because we've lost it, it's not in the generator position, you lose this engine interlock uh, relay. This will de-energize. And when it de-energizes, we have no power to the pump 1B relay. So pump 1B will stop working. Pump 2B will continue to work because generator 1 is online. So it's not, it doesn't have a massive implication for the hydraulics because um, we said we lost engine 2. So engine um, 2B pump is working. Engine 1A pump is working because on the engine, engine 1 is working. We do lose pump 1B because we're kind of load shedding from an electrical perspective. We do lose pump 1B, but in terms of the hydraulics, there's no, there's no real issue there. So the generate what's supplying the power to the AC bus is just as important as the actual power being available to it. Now, this, the way this logic works, um, let's imagine you're in the hangar and you've got external power plugged in and you want to run the hydraulic pump. Obviously, if you put it to auto, it's not really going to work because the flaps are going to be not at zero necessarily. Even if you put the switch to the on position with external power on, nothing will work because the generator is not online. So the generator line contactor will not be in the generator position. So that means this engine inter interlock relay doesn't work. And that means even if you switch it on, the pump doesn't work either. However, there is something called a ground maintenance bypass relay. And it's linked in to the weight on wheel system. So we're in, let's look at the situation where we're in the hangar. And we turn on with external power on and we turn on the pump. So that closes there. Power comes along to here and it goes to here. But of course, we know that's not going to work because the generator is not online. But power also comes up here to this ground maintenance bypass relay. Boom, 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 boom. This is the auto mode relay, so uh, this has got nothing to do with it at this stage. We're not interested in that. In fact, as long as this is de-energized, we're okay. <clears throat> and as long as they're weight on wheels, boom. That causes the ground maintenance bypass relay to energize. Boom, boom, boom. When the ground maintenance bypass relay energizes, it allows the power to bypass this engine interlock relay. It bypasses it by coming up through here to here. This is now closed. Comes along to there. Boom, boom, boom. That closes these contacts. And as long as we've got AC bus 2 power on, which we will have if we've got external power on, boom, the pump 1B will run. and uh, everything is good. It doesn't work in auto. That won't work in the auto position. So um, the only way for you to get the um, um, ground maintenance bypass relay on the ground with external power, the only way is to turn the pumps to on. The auto position won't work. This is the pump 2B control, which is virtually the same, if not it is the same, as the uh, 1B control. The only difference is the power supply. So we've got an AC1 this time powering the 2B pump. 
we got DC buzz one providing the control. And this time the key thing to um, turn on the pump or not in terms of electrical power is, is looking at the position of the generator one GLC, and that must be in the generator position um, to energize the interlock. The actual interlock, interlock relays in a physical different junction box, it's in junction box 11. But we've still got the ground maintenance bypass switch, uh, relay. Um, the, the auto mode is the same, you know, flaps not at zero, et cetera, et cetera. So virtually the same. I won't need to go through it all again. Pump 3A control. Very, very simple. You have a switch is either on or off. Normally it's left in the on position. So with the switch in the on position, you've got a power supply from DC bus two for the control. It comes along and energizes a pump relay. And, and the power for pump 3A is coming from AC bus. It doesn't care who's providing power this time. It doesn't matter if it's a generator or it doesn't matter if it's uh, APU. It doesn't matter if it's external power. If there's power on AC bus two, boom, it's going to work. And nothing to do with flaps not at zero because the pump 3A is running continuously. OK, this is pump 3B control. Very similar to pumps uh, 1B and 2B, but there are some subtle differences. So we have a power supply this time from the battery bus for the control and two power supplies or two potential power supplies for the pump itself. The normal one, which is AC bus one and a, an a alternative one, which is from the ADG bus. We'll come back and talk about this in a minute. But the normal power supply, when it's in on or in the auto position, will come in, it'll be taking it from AC bus one. Now, there is a subtle difference. There's, you'll notice there's no ground maintenance override relay. We don't need one. If you turn on the pump switch to the on position, boom, 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 it will energize the pump relay. It doesn't care who's providing power in terms of the AC. It doesn't matter if it's a generator. It doesn't matter if it's the APU. It doesn't matter if it's external power. It doesn't care. It's going to go boom, boom, boom and energize the pump control relay. So as long as you've got power on AC buzz one, boom, 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 the pump will run. In the auto position, which is what it normally would be in, um, it does matter about who's supplying power. And obviously it's also looking at the flaps. So in the auto position, that switch contact there will close and it puts power down here to the auto mode relay. We're looking for a ground signal. So we need at least one generator online. At least one of the engine generators must be online. It doesn't matter which one. So the ground signal will either come from there or it comes through there. Then it's looking for the flaps not to be at zero. Boom. There's a ground signal. Boom, boom, boom. That energizes the auto mode relay. And that allows power to come from the auto switch through that, the now closed auto mode relay. And it energizes the pump 3B relay. OK, and power is coming from AC bus one. Remember, even if you lose generator one or generator two, it doesn't matter which one you lose. Because the electrical system transfers, you will always have power normally on the AC bus one. So that will always be available, really, under normal, even under a failure of a generator, and it doesn't matter which one. <clears throat> now, we, when we did flight controls, we, we saw how, uh, how important hydraulics were, and we need at least one hydraulic system. Now, if you've got an ADG situation um, caused by a double engine failure, that means you will have lost engine one, engine two uh, engine pumps, and you will also have lost engine um, the, the number one B pump and the number two B pump as well. So you've lost four pumps. Um, and you've lost AC bus one and AC bus two. So you've also lost the three A pumps. So you've actually lost five pumps. Now, the normal power supply for the 3B pump is AC Buzz 1. Well, we've lost that, so we're going to have to get it from somewhere else. So there's an ADG deploy relay. When the ADG deploys, boom, it energizes this relay and directly connects up power 
to the 3B pump from the ADG bus, which is power from the air gen driven generator. So boom. And you'll notice it doesn't matter what position the 3B switch is in. It could even be switched off because it's a complete and automatic hookup. It's not looking at any switch position in an ADG situation because this in an ADG situation caused by a double engine failure, this will be the only pump we have. And we definitely got to have it. If we don't have this pump, that means there's no hydraulics at all. And that means no flight controls, no rudder, no aileron, no elevator. That's not good news. That's a bad thing. So we definitely need to have this switched on. It doesn't matter about the switch, it can even be switched off. That will come on automatically in an ADG situation. So this slide just shows you what <clears throat> pumps are available depending on what the aircraft configuration is. Just for clarity, the white box means the pump is available, the shaded box means the pump is not available. Um, so last slide, we're just about there now, everyone. So um, here we go. Just shows you all the caution messages um, associated with the hydraulic system. So we just go through them very quickly. So uh, the caution message, hide EDP 1A or 2A, that's, that information is looking at the pressure switch in the pressure manifold coming from the engine pump, and it will indicate a low pressure condition from the engine driven pump. Uh, the trip point, I think, is 1500 PSI. Then you've got a similar thing for the B pumps, or all the electric pumps, so 1B, 2B, and then the two electric pumps for the number three system. Um, so it's looking at the pressure switch from each of those. High one, two, or three high temperature. So the temp sensor is in the reservoir. That comes on if the fluid temperature is above 96 degrees C. Um, low hide one, two, three low pressure. <clears throat> that means there's a low pressure situation from both the pump, the engine pump, and the uh, electric pump for the number one, number two systems. And for the number three system, a low pressure switch on the manifold for both the A pump and the B pump. And the trip point is 1800 PSI. Hydraulic shutoff valve one and two in amber. That means the valve has not moved to the correct position selected by the fire push button. <clears throat> when you do have a fire and you push the fire push button, the valve will close, hopefully. And just to uh, confirm, you get an advisory message, hydraulic shutoff valve one or two closed. That is just confirming to you that it's closed. And if you bring up the synoptic page, of course, you'll be able to see the valve in the closed position. <clears throat> 